Ladies and gentlemen, this morning I want to give you the Atomic Forge. So let me tell you what it is. So all this meeting basically talks about how we can make and direct MET on the atomic level. And there are two paradigms to do that. So one is just start from scratch. Let's pick atoms on the surface, let's manipulate them. This is how nanotechnology started. This is what we were able to achieve in 25 years. So it, it works. It costs a lot of money, it requires integration between STM and surface chemistry, but we can make multiple qubit devices now. Problem is that it's surfaces, it's slow, and it's limited range of materials. The second paradigm, which has kind of attracts everyone's attention since uh, Eric Drexel's book, is the molecular machines. So we use chemistry, we synthesize them, we hope that at some point they will assemble, kind of much like the Terminator. Uh, truth is, however, we probably have to somehow manipulate them. So what we do is we assemble them bottom up, but we still need a way to assemble these machines in the functional constructions. So what I want to bring to your attention is what we think is the third way of doing it. And as many things, it started by the random observation, so about several years ago, when we noticed that if you stick the material covered by amorphous version in the electron microscope, the electron beam can induce the crystallization of the material. And while it does it, we can actually observe it with atomic resolution. Notice that when we talk about the atomic fabrication, we come up with the requirement that it should be atomic level, it should be a feedback, have feedback, it should be correctable. And notice that in this case, unlike molecular machines and much easier than STM, we get atomic resolution for free. That's what electron microscopes do. So uh, our thought two years ago was to say, okay, come on, we use an AFM to draw things on the surface. So I work for the Department of Energy, I write DOE logo. I also like Rammstein, so we draw the Rammstein logo and uh, my colleagues still cannot forgive me for this because they think it's not music. Uh, but what we can do is take the AFM control electronics and connect it to the electron microscope, which is really expensive piece of equipment, which is really not designed for being controlled. But we've done it and it works. So this is the example of the structure which is written in the amorphous material and the letters are basically 10 atomic columns uh, around. So obviously if you've done it once, it makes sense to do it twice. So we incorporate it on the helium matter machine, on the liquid cell machine, so we can draw from gases and from liquid phase. And the question is, how does it, what can be done in the future? And we have observed, both our groups and our colleagues worldwide, that actually electron beam can produce tremendous amount of controlled modification of solid. So two years ago, we were able to burn holes in two-dimensional materials and observe how the material reconstructs in the different crystalline phase. Uh, also two years ago, we were able to observe how a single interstitial atom is basically kicked by the electron beam inside the lattice, so we can move it where it wants, or where it wants to go. We were able to observe how the oxygen vacancies inside the solid order to form the brown millerite planes. And the question that I bring to your attention, so the idea here is, can we take the electron beam control and do the same thing as Don Eigler did 25 years ago? I mean, it's a long time ago, and SPM facility far, far away. It's far away from Oak Ridge. Here it's actually very close. And do the same thing, but in the bulk, not on the surface. And this is the whole idea. Oops, this is the wrong place. And this is the whole idea of the atomic forge. So what if we use the electron microscope not as an observational tool, but the tool to control matter? So I've shown you that uh, we can do this uh, small modifications. Now we just need to learn to control it. And this is, I believe, where AI is absolutely essential for very simple reasons. First of all, when you form the subatomic beam, you already learn machine learning in order to uh, use the aberration character. The aberration character microscope appeared 10 years ago because computers allowed to tune the 64 elements automatically and not do it by hand. That's the only reason why it was not done 30 years ago. It generates a huge volume of the data. So in some volumes, we generate as much data as uh, Large Hadron Super Collider. But this data controls the information of solid. And speaking about, uh, it's important thing, would it be one machine or is it sustainable? Can we scale it up? Well, there are hundreds and thousands of the platform in the world which are kind of not really used. So we can, if it works, we can scale up really fast. So the AI needs here are very straightforward. So first of all, we need to build the libraries of beam matter interactions, this kind of radiation damage on the atomic level. 
So we need to build the libraries of cause and effect for specific structure. And ideally, we want to do it on the fly. We need to have the AI control of beam position and intensity. And what we'll get is 3D fabrication. So this is where we were 500 years ago. This is where we want to be in the future. Thank you. Wonderful.